sure it makes me look a little thick on the side. <laughs> Anyways, uh, hello everybody. I'm Alex Grichewin, uh Director for Advanced Lung and Heart Disease with uh, HRN. Um, uh, today we're going to be doing just a, qu a couple quick exercises really fast, just some normal stretches. So on just a simple basic stretch, uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and have us, if you're not already seated, it'd probably be best if you are seated. But you're going to sit down and we're going to do some stretches, oblique stretches, uh, and some lung stretches. Okay. So first, as I'm sitting down right now, um, here's how it's, let me just make sure. Okay. So as I'm sitting down right now, uh, or actually, you know, probably just, I'll just do this standing, but it's best if you are sitting. So we're going to do a quick stretch. Uh, this is called lung stretch. The, the purpose of a lung stretch is to stretch the lungs out a little bit, stretching them out, making them, them to be a little bit more compliant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a deep breath in. Nice and deep, then I'm going to hold my breath at that point, and I'm going to move and try to move about 90 degrees, turning 90 degrees, and holding that breath for about three seconds, then exhaling as I come back up. So I'm going to switch to the other side too. So I'm going to take another deep breath in. Hold, and get my stretch right there. When I do this, I should feel a very large stretch on this side. As I'm moving over to my left side, I should feel stretch on the right side. What's happening is the pressure, when I fill up both lungs with air, and I move 90 degrees, what's going to happen is going to push the air from that right lung, I mean, in this case, my left lung, to my right. So it's almost like taking two balloons. Like if I had two balloons... So let's say I have two balloons and I have a tube attached to that balloon, okay? If I clench this balloon, let's say I clench it, this, the, the pressure in that balloon will actually get pushed over to this other side, and of course this will expand more, okay? So when I move over, so when I take a deep breath, I hold my breath, and you're only going to hold your breath for about three seconds anyways, but this is a physical lung stretch. It's where I take a deep breath in, hold my breath, I'm filling up both, both balloons, remember that? I'm going to turn 90 degrees, and it's going to transfer the pressure to the other side, hyper-expanding my left side if I'm, uh, if I'm uh, moving over to the right side, right? And the same thing with the left side there, too. Okay, so let's do that together real quick. Everyone take a deep breath in. Hold and twist or bend. Exhale, coming back up. Take another deep breath in. Hold. Very good. Now let's go ahead and just let's shake a little loose. Go ahead and do some shoulder rotations. Simple shoulder rotations, nice and easy. Good circular motions with your shoulders. Okay, your shoulders should be making circular motions. All right, good rotations. Okay, next thing, I'm gonna put one hand out in front. I'm gonna bring it over. I'm gonna pull my elbow in to kind of give a nice stretch to my deltoids. I'll hold that stretch for about 15 seconds. Okay, switch to the other side. Okay, chin down a sternum. We're going to rotate, head rotations, three times each direction. Good. All right. Everyone take a deep breath in. Can't hear. Okay. Getting levels. Okay. Can you switch the camera over to here, please? Okay. 
Can everyone hear me okay? Now, sometimes you just have to increase your volume a little bit, but um, the mic is right here, so you should be able to hear me just fine. Uh, anyways, all right. We're good? Okay. All right, so on today's topic, uh, I'm going to be basically, uh, so as a veteran, um, uh, so we're, we're, we're going to talk a little about, you know, uh, the veterans and, of course, some of the exposures that a lot of people that were in the military had to be exposed with. Uh, so today I would like to talk about veterans and the, uh, the unique health challenges that might be present, uh, that may be present in, in veteran patients. So according to U.S. Depart uh, US Department of Affairs or Research via Gov, so it's or research.va.gov. So if you're a veteran, I can't, John, yeah. I can't see anything here, man. Oh. Can you move over, yeah, over here or something? Yeah. That's, that's good for you. Yeah, that's good. Okay. They want me to read this out verbatim um, just because it's, um, I want to make sure that I get all the information correct on this. So according to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs or research.va.gov, if you're a veteran, and I highly recommend checking out this website, of course. Uh, so these are some of the issues veterans may come across according to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Veterans may suffer from other respiratory problems through exposure to infectious agents or airborne environmental hazards. Examples of respiratory diseases that may be caused by infectious agents are tuberculosis, lung cancer, and pneumonia. Many veterans were exposed to airborne environmental hazards due to military services such as Agent Orange, uh, burn pits, sandstorms, or fumes from uh, aircraft exhaust. Just a quick, a quick look at uh, tuberculosis. Now, I don't ha uh, want to sound uh, uh, like an alarmist, but despite tuberculosis in the United States being at an all-time low, largely thanks to antibiotics, up to 13 million people in the United States are still estimated to be infected with a latent case of TB, or tuberculosis. And just recently, this last Saturday, the Washington Post published an article and I'll just read it. Uh, read the headline. Authorities seek to arrest woman with tuberculosis for refusing care. So while TB, I was just reading that off. Um, so while tuberculosis is relatively not an issue to be worried about for the general population, at least knowing your risk and speaking with your doctor about your risks uh, level is never, of course, a bad idea. There is a lot of great research in the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs uh, has done and is actively doing. Here are some articles that stood out to me. Uh, one was the mental health and respiratory problems. Veterans who served in Afghanistan and Iraq and had a mental health diagnosis are more likely to have respiratory problems, according to the 2018 study by researchers, uh, researchers at VA Portland Healthcare System and the Oregon Health and Science University. The researchers uh, looked at data for more than 180,000 veterans and found that 14% had a respiratory condition such as bron uh, bronchitis, asthma, or COPD. Of that group, 77% also had a diagnosis of mental health conditions. According to the team, the results show the importance of care coordination for veterans with multiple conditions. Dust mites may also trigger asthma. Dust mites are little tiny spider-like creatures that can trigger allergic reactions like runny noses, uh, itchy or watery eyes, and sneezing. Researchers at the VA Department uh, or the VA Maryland Healthcare Systems are looking how dust mites affect the immune system and set off respiratory problems in humans. Previous research, including a two, uh, 2011 study, uh, has suggested that dust mites can be one of several possible triggers that may explain new onset asthma uh, among Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. The team is testing the hypothesis, of course, that Iraq and Af uh, Afghanistan, I'm sorry, Afghanistan veterans 
have been exposed to a much higher level of inhaled pollutants or particles, which may explain higher rates of asthma and other respiratory problems in this group. Research hopes that their, uh, that their work will be added to the body of knowledge on the cause of the respiratory sy uh, symptoms in these veterans. So just let me know if you have any. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about what I just talked about in this article. Uh, when we talk about pollutants, uh, remember, uh, what was the, uh, first off, how do you know you have dust mites? So I, I, I found this out uh, with uh, uh, one of our, at a skilled nursing facility, how they test for dust mites. And on the edges, it's really clever, because I, I never knew you'd, uh, this was a thing. So let's say you have your bed, and this is your mattress, okay? So here's your mattress. All right, and of course, here's your, you know, maybe you have two pillows or something. On the edges, on the very edge of the mattress, if you see red, or you take a, um, I believe they used a uh, piece of tissue. They took a tissue and they wiped the edges of the bed. If you wipe the edges of the bed and it comes out as red particles, those were the dust mites. Um, now, I've never done that before, uh, except when they were talking about dust mites in patient beds. But um, if you're ever wondering, you know, kind of do your own research on that. You don't have to take what I just said. But uh, there is a lot of ways to check if you have dust mites. Uh, we also did find that 60% of the people that uh, come in and out of hospitals uh, with reoccurring asthma attacks or uh, uh, even with... Um, uh, uh, just a heightening of current symptoms, kind of like a, you know, bronchiospasm or just a, uh, you know, any other the, other types of illnesses. Anyways, well, what I'm trying to, trying to say is that, you know, you always want to do your own research, but uh, what well, we did find that 60% of the people that go back and forth to the hospital with exacerbations and reoccurring pneumonia, reoccurring this, uh, allergies, their home was causing them the problem. Uh, now, in somebody's home, somebody's home can be spotless, like perfectly clean and everything, but the one thing that we don't normally do is look inside the ductwork. Uh, and of course, you shouldn't be looking inside your own ductwork, you know, but having a company come out to check your ductwork to see if there's any mold buildup could be a reason or a trigger of why that's happening with you uh, often, you know, you going back and forth to the hospital or having a heightening of, of symptoms, what we call an exacerbation. So let me just erase this here. Okay, so how often should we change home filters? So well, let's look at all the filters real quick. What in, your, what in your home actually has filters, first off? Now, your fish tank, sure. Okay, does your concentrator have filters? Yes. Okay, so concentrators have filters. Uh, the nebulizer machines have filters. Uh, CPAP and BiPAP machines should have filters. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things, but not, not just the air conditioning heating. So when we, let's say we're going to clean a filter off of our concentrator. Okay, so we remove, it's, it's a little meshing that sticks all, either on the back or on the side, depending on, your ty on what type of oxygen concentrator you have. And what you would do is you would take that, you would wash it with warm soapy water, and then let it air dry. And then once it's air dry, just replace it and put it back on there. Okay. The internal filters you don't ever mess with. Uh, the internal filters are you have to open up the the machine itself with the, if you ever seen inside of a concentrator, a lot of lot of electricity is flowing through there. Uh, I should say, but it's it's a lot of a lot of meshing inside of that, that machine. So getting confused about that is, is you know, that's the reason why you don't clean the internal filters. The DME company that sets you up with that concentrator should be coming out to change out the internal filters. But anyways, the filters that you should be concentrating on are the, uh, the filters on the side or on the back, depending on your concentrator. Uh, nebulizer machines, uh, just the small compressors, have this small, very small cylindrical, I would say probably about 11 to 12 millimeters in, in, in diameter. 
the circumference. Okay, so it's not very large; they're very, very small. But you pull them out, and there's this big tail end inside there, and that's the part that actually sticks in the machine to filter. Uh, so a good way to know if your filter is blocked up is simply by turning on your nebulizer with some fluid in there. If you turn on your nebulizer and the mist coming out is coming up a little bit and just drops back down, then the particle sizes are too large. Uh, you want good micron sizes, meaning the mist should not fall down because it's so heavy. It should be, so the particle should be very, very small and fine where you know, when you turn on the nebulizer, you're holding on the nebulizer uh, basin itself where you put it on your mouth. And you see the aerosol come out. If it's dropping down because of gravity, it's too heavy. That means that there's something impeding flow. And what could be impeding flow is a blocked up filter. So you might want to change out those filters. Uh, changing out nasal cannulas. In a facility, it's once a week or as needed. So nasal cannulas, we usually change them once a week or as needed. Inside of a home, it's a little different. So sometimes you don't have to change out filters for a, uh, for a long period of time. But what I like, what I prefer is um, every two weeks inside of a home, the nasal cannula gets changed. That's what I prefer. But that doesn't mean that's, that's the way it should be. I, I just prefer that. A lot of DME companies uh, change out uh, nasal cannulas once a month. And that's pretty standard. I just... I kind of like to be more preventative sometimes, you know. So let's say you have your nasal cannula and you want to clean it. You can't really, you can clean the outside, but you can't really clean the inside per se because the, the small diameter in there, you would have to take a very fine brush. But if you did, those brushes sometimes can leave some fragments of that bristles inside. So when you inhale it, you know, it goes inside your lungs or in your airways. So that's not a very, very good thing, of course. So yes, you can, but it's not it's not preferred. But um, what I would do, what I would do uh, is when you're changing the filters, have a backup filter that's already cleaned and dried. So let's say you're going to clean your filters once a week, and there's one filter, so you should have two filters available. Okay, one that's already on the device, one that's already been cleaned by you. Okay. So then when it comes time to cleaning, you remove that filter, take the one that was off the counter or something or in a Ziploc bag, put it back on there while the other one that's now dirty is going to get cleaned. And then after the week, it should be when it comes time to changing your filter, you have a replacement, you know. But um, it is, uh, it, you know, we do see it common where somebody keeps their concentrator running, but they only do it for a short period of time. It's not preferred just because you, do, you want to make sure there's fil a filter on the device while it's running because the intake, as it's pulling air into it, and if there was a large particle or, you know, some, you know, those filters, they're, they're, they're very, uh, they're not very dense. You know, they're, uh, they're it's just simple meshing. It traps large particles. So if a large particle came in while it's running and the filter wasn't on there, then it might occlude or, it might go inside the machine and cause problems. So it probably wouldn't be a great idea, but I have seen a lot of times a lot of people do that. But again, it's not the proper way of doing it. Okay. All right. So not to change subject, because sure. obviously this is really important. Sure. Um, but to get back on, on track, um, the main, just to have an open discussion, obviously anyone can, put in the comments section if you want to add to it uh, if we have any veterans that are watching today um, to get back to the main discussion I mean it's interesting how veterans also are fighting when they come back home uh, we obviously hear about you know uh, PTSD um, but we don't hear a lot about the like if they have breathing issues uh, when they come back home and I, th I, I found that really interesting I mean I don't know how you felt on that one? I mean, you know, I was I was in the army in 1999 at for, uh, 1999 in August in uh, uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I stayed there for quite a bit. Uh, uh, the uh, 42nd Infantry, 24th Division, I believe, uh, 
Yes, that is right. Uh, anyways, um, a lot of people had PTSD. A lot of people have a lot of mental complications, including I had some, you know, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder when I uh, was discharged out of the uh, Army, uh, honorably, of course, but I was discharged uh, out of the Army after serving my time. And a lot of people were depressed. Depression itself can drop your immune system, and it can also do a lot, but the word depressed, you know, when people think of depressed, well, what are you really thinking of? Sadness, right? It's not really the case. Depressed means, if you really separate the words, like it's a compound word, if you separate them out, de rest, deep rest. You know, if you really kind of just, you know, separate them a little bit, uh, it kind of spells out deep rest. When somebody's depressed, that means their body is, no matter how much you're trying, your body just shut down and says, I don't want to do it. Just don't want to do it. It's not necessarily somebody's sad. I mean, it is, but it, it, the body can only take so much. So when you put stress upon stress upon stress upon stress upon stress, it turns into quicksand. You know, like the deeper you're in, the more, the less you can move. And then, of course, it doesn't matter how benevolent of a person you are, how nice you are, everybody has a breaking point. I mean, everybody has. You can be Mother Teresa and have a breaking point. Everybody has a breaking point. You know, it's, um, and, you know, it, the, the wild side comes out of you, meaning you, you're very nice and then something triggers you and you just turn into this animal. You know, you, you get very hostile, you get defensive, uh, you try to step away. Depression, or what it should be labeled as the body needing deep rest or more rest. Uh, like if I'm doing something and I don't feel like doing it anymore, I'm not ambitious towards it, I don't have any, I don't want to do that anymore. It's, it's not necessarily my, I don't want to do it. It's just my body is kind of giving out, saying, nope. Let's move that, leave that to the side. And you start leaving a lot of things to the side. What's really causing it is something in your head that's, that's creating that. It's not necessarily a therapy in a sense. It's, you know, you just got too much in your head. At least that's how I felt. But when a psychologist was explaining this to me, um, that depression is a way of, uh, of saying that your body needs more time to rest. It needs more time to rest. It's just too much, you know. So um, now as uh, health rela uh, relations are in the military, especially in boot camp, where we were exposed to a lot, but not a tremendous amount like some people would do while they're in uh, like Iraq or, you know, uh, Kuwait or whatever, uh, Desert Storm. I mean, it doesn't, people are exposed to a lot, bombs and, and the chemicals that make up the bombs and the exposure from that as well as from in a different country where maybe your immune system isn't up to par with, uh, with people in that community maybe. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different diseases and different, uh, different climates, different, you know, there's different pathogens, there's different germs, different type of germs in different locations. Uh, but, yeah, I mean. I'm sure that's something you don't think about. No, you definitely don't think about that at all. I mean, you don't. All, you, all you're doing is trying to fight a war or fight the cause, and uh, you hope for the best. But when people come after discharge, you know, honorably discharge or just discharge from uh, from the military, uh, yeah, they, they're – I mean, I, I, I can't say enough of it, but I definitely don't want to go out of bounds on what I want to say because that's why I'm kind of hesitant of saying certain things. But the – just like that video test, we did a video testimony on uh, on uh, Tuesday with this gentleman that uh, not necessarily military, but he was still fighting a cause. Uh, he was a um, he uh, worked as a firefighter. How long? See, it was like uh, I want to say twenty years. It was like twenty years, something like it that. It was a really long time. I know that much. Yeah, it was a very long time. And this gentleman, you know, he had a, a team. He was in charge of that team. I'm not sure he was a deputy. He was a deputy captain, or he was a... No, I think he was a chief. Chief? Yeah, I think so. Because I... I, well, I, I... I would have to ask Sonia to confirm that, but yeah. 
It was like a chief. Yeah, he was, I mean, literally uh, just a fantastic person. I mean, if you just heard his story, which we did have, we do have the video testimony. It's just not out yet because we just did it. So it has to go through editing first. But there was a gentleman that had, you know, very severe fibrosis. He had pulmonary fibrosis. He had all these complications and every, he said this, not me. The, 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 our patient said this, that all of his doctors and all of his specialists all said that there's nothing we can do. And this is going to be a death sentence. This is pretty much, let's just keep you comfortable. And, you know, he mentioned, well, what if I do some, re, uh, you know, some pony rehab? And the, uh, the, uh, the clinician was basing everything off of statistics. And he's like, currently there's nothing there. Nothing's really going to help you. And he's like, nothing. So this is it. You know, that's what he was kind of expressing. Like, this is it. This is the best I'm going to be. He said, you're going to be on auction for the rest of your life. Uh, this is the best as you can do, you know, and this is, this is as good as, it's get, as it gets. So I'm not sure if it was his wife or him that made the decision. I think it was his wife. But it, he talked to a doctor, I remember. And the doctor mentioned HRN, us, and he uh, participated with us, of course. Uh, he went through the whole entire program. He was not able to walk to – he was having the most difficult time just standing up and getting to the bathroom, Okay. So we're not talking a long distance. He was on oxygen. He was on, you know, everything you could possibly imagine. The guy, after he was done, he walked to his doctor's appointment. Walked. Okay. He walked to his doctor's appointment. I'm not kidding. He walked. It was uh, uh, several miles. He walked to his doctor's appointment without oxygen. And it's the specialist and everyone that said, you'll never get better. This is as good as it's going to get. They were like, they were expecting this guy was supposed to be in a wheelchair or something. They were expecting something different than what they saw. And he and his son, uh, you know, went to the doctor's uh, appointment but walked to the doctor's appointment. So they went in and he says, where's your oxygen? He says, I don't need it anymore. He says, no, that's not right. So they checked it like, well, everything's fine. And then they checked this. They did testing here. They did testing this, testing this. Like, How in the heck did this happen? How did you just get better? And... You know, the guy's a very religious person, but and I, I love religion and everything. Don't please don't get me wrong there, but it kind of sometimes uh, some people discredit what we are doing and saying it was an act of faith. You know that that did this, and I was like, no, it's the it's the it's the clinicians that that helped you. You know, but he was very 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 grateful. He was super grateful. Um, uh, but we got him up to about five. Five miles, Shannon, uh, our, our, our uh, respiratory therapist, was the one that worked with him. Uh, he's up to about four to five miles, I believe, uh, without st- well, I know without stopping. Four to five miles, uh, his fibrosis has gone down quite a bit. You know, something that they couldn't be done is actually, got, actually happened. And this is not the first time we had a fibrosis patient. We have a lot of fibrotic patients. You know, we have a lot of long-term COVID, a lot of scarring on the lungs. We, we always do the job. We always do the job. You know, our job is to get people better, and we exa- that's exactly what we do. So just to yeah. caveat off of that, um, so, you know, you, you go through this, you do, you do this job, uh, and this is me putting myself in the shoes of, uh, of, of somebody who's a veteran, a firefighter, mm. somebody who would, you know, encounter – uh, these different things, um, and you're doing the job, but you really don't think about the long term. You're yeah. thinking about, and it's just incredible. I mean, uh, Facebook user uh, said uh, said this uh, that uh, their dad was a Vietnam veteran, uh, and he got stomach cancer, uh, which was believed uh, to have come from Agent Orange, uh, and he passed away before he was even 32. So it's just it's just one of those things where you don't. I'm sorry for your loss. I know it, it. I'm not sure if it was a long time ago, but Facebook user, I, I don't know your name, but um, my condolences completely, especially ours. Um, you know, when your when your dad fights in a war and then dies early because of something that could have been done better, you know, maybe. Uh, um, but yeah, it's we it, can't thank you enough for the service. It, it's it's really incredible just what. 
uh, they're willing to sacrifice, really. Um, yes, absolutely. And one that provides a service like that. Um, so that leads me into uh, our next, our first question, um, which is, uh, as a veteran, uh, that sir, if I was a veteran that served my country, and uh, what can I do uh, to help myself if I suffer from any of these diseases? So, like COPD or uh, TB or yeah. lung cancer. Like, what could what could I do to help myself? Rehabilitation is going to be the because it. it we can blindside everybody and, and be like, do this, do that. Like Denise Sawyer Anderson uh, says, I want to be sure that uh, this is about the one hour breathing rehab. I don't understand what that is. What is that? I think she was just looking for clarification that she had the right stream. That's oh, it. oh, yeah, the right stream. Yes, you're in the right stream. Um, the one hour uh, breathing rehab, what we. So HRN, we, we do the. Uh, the rehabilitation, but it's it's not an hour of rehab. It's um, so patients do the therapy virtually. Uh, we are the highest successor for that. So there is no other company in the United States or in this world that does what we do. We are literally the only ones, but we are the top. And the reason why is because we're the only ones. No, if you base the statistics off of traditional facility which we have our own traditional facility here people come in physically to do rehabilitation as well as people do it virtually 99 percent of all patients are always doing it virtually because they don't have to leave their home they can be anywhere in the united states anywhere part of the world and still do rehabilitation just fine as long as they have wi-fi access or you know the ability to get onto the internet so um uh so the uh rehabilitation i don't I like in the beginning. I do some morning, some beginning exercises, types of things, you know. But um, it's not really rehab. Uh, you do the rehab with a clinician like me. I'm under the Maryland Board of Physicians as a respiratory care practitioner. Uh, I specialize in pulmonary rehabilitation. I've, that's all I ever done is pulmonary rehabilitation, and that's what our clinicians here do. The respiratory therapist, and they also serve into the pulmonary rehab side and cardiac rehab side of course and denise if you have any uh further questions of uh, just about how you can get in touch with the program the phone number is 410-871-4601 uh you know one of our um one of our uh uh staff will definitely be able to help you yeah patient coordination usually will uh take care of that uh glenda bushman uh does medicare cover this program of course they do yeah, this is a Medicare, uh, uh, Medicare approved program that also means other insurance, commercial insurances usually cover this program. I think there's one, uh, United, no, United does. I have to double check, but it is, you have to call in and they, they have to do a verification with your insurance just to make sure you're good to go and you're all covered and everything before you start, you know. So, um, and if you're trying to get into the program, uh, you can always just show up. Just call them up. You have to sign a waiver uh, until you actually get into the program. But we can do like a class orientation where you can ask questions and things like that. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but that's up to you. And, again, if you're uh, really interested, just feel free to call that number. One of our staff will definitely be able to help yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, as far as the uh, breathing techniques, uh, uh, back at the first f first couple minutes of the, of the stream, uh, Alex did some stretching and explained how it helps your breathing uh, mm -hmm. so feel free to rewind or after the stream is over go ahead and rewatch that and you'll get plenty of uh, plenty of those uh, breathing techniques yes uh, to move on to the to our next question uh, mm -hmm. how do how do these issues that are brought up in the article such as TB lung cancer um, the, the different uh, aspect uh, different diseases uh, how do they affect uh, the, the breathing. What should our patients, or what should anyone that is listening, uh, look out for in terms of uh, well, signs? Well, symptoms. Well, like if you're looking at symptoms, I always like to write in a journal every morning, um, or at least once a day. But just kind of describing how you're feeling mentally. I'll do what they call a brain dumping, and what that means is that. You take whatever information is in your head right now that's currently just on your mind and just put it on paper. 
and even if it doesn't make any sense, just whatever's in your head. Okay, I'm thinking, like right now, I'm thinking uh, of Jeremy. I'm going to write down that name. I'm, gonna, I'm thinking of, oh, I got to pay bills. Uh, I'm thinking of this. I got to write this down. Just dump it all on the piece of paper to empty your head, you know, so you can literally see everything that's in front of you that's in your head that's causing stress or anxiety. Um, one of them should also be health. You know, how are you feeling this morning? How's your breathing? What are, uh, do you have a temperature? Did you check your temperature? Are you at the same weight as you were yesterday? Um, you know, uh, so let's look at symptoms really quick. With tuberculosis, that's, the symptoms are pretty, very vast. Uh, you will, I mean, just very vast. It's, it's a long definition of, of symptoms for tuberculosis, but um, let's, t- let's talk about, let's look at the first starting symptoms just to make it easy, okay? If you have any of these symptoms at all, report to your doctor, okay? So an increase in work of breathing, increase in uncontrollable wheezing, okay? Uh, exercise tolerance, you know, like you're out of shape, but that's not something you need to talk to your doctor about, but you can, There's nothing wrong with that. But um, let's say you're producing a lot more sputum and let's take a look at the colors, you know, write them down, you know, uh, do you have a fever? Uh, how many times are you coughing per day? Uh, do a cat test. You know what a cat test is? Let me, do we have a CAT here? Uh, let me grab one really quick. If you guys don't mind, give me just one minute, one second. Well, 10, give me 10 seconds. Actually, you're still with me because you can still hear me. So right now I'm running. Do, 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 do. I'm just going to grab one CAT. <coughs> As you're going to hear, I still have a leftover cough. Because <coughs> I was out sick like a little bit. But that's all right. There we go. Did you have an edit? Can I borrow a CAT? I don't know what the heck they went. Oh, maybe they're in here, actually. Oh, I think. Yes, I do have it. Never mind. Sorry. Oh, yeah, thank you. I mean, where the heck else am I supposed to look for them? They're in the file cabinets. Okay. All Boy, right. If you could hear what I heard, it's awesome, <laughs> and what I right? just heard. Okay, so a CAT is very simple. Uh, this is a uh, CAT stands for COPD assessment test, but you don't have to have COPD to do the test. It's just it's a generic test. We just keep calling a CAT, um, and it's a ve- it's a widely used test. The um, information gather you can grab that grab the CAT just uh, you can easily grab that off the COPD Foundation, uh, American Lung Association. There's a place over in California, the university. I got find out which forget which one uh they st george that's the one st george's um hospital system i think it's but it's it's in california uh they make their own cats anyways so how is your copd take the cop assessment test or what we call cat this questionnaire will help you and your healthcare professional to measure the impact that COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is having on your well-being or daily life. So what you would do is for each item, place an X in the box that best describes your current situation. Please ensure that you only select one response for each question. Let me give you an example. Five is going to be the worst. Zero is going to be the best. Not necessarily happy, but the best. So let's say the one example of a question would be, I am very happy versus I am very sad. Which number would you give me? Five being the worst, zero being the best. Okay. So would you, when you do a CAT, it's not based off of what happened six months ago. Try to base it off of what's been happening to you for the last two weeks. Okay. And doing a CAT once a week is great. You know, it's just going to, you give this information to your doctor, and your doctor analyzes it and takes a look and see, 
what problems you're having. So let's go over uh, some of these questions. Actually, let's go over all these questions really quick. Coughing. Five being I cough all the time, zero being I never cough. Which number would you give yourself? So would you give yourself a zero, which means I never cough? A one, two, three, four, five, five, meaning that I cough all the time. So that's question number one. Question number two, congestion. F uh, two, no, question number two is congestion levels. Five would be my chest is full of phlegm or mucus. Zero would be I have no congestion in my chest at all. Now the next question, the third question is chest tightness. Five would be my chest feels very tight. Zero would be my chest does not feel tight at all. Fourth question, when I walk up a hill or a flight of stairs, about 14 steps, I am not out of breath. Versus a five, uh, when I walk up a hill or a flight of stairs, I'm completely out of breath. Which number would you give yourself on that question four? Question five, I am, this is on limitations. Um, five, so number five is um, on limitations. Zero would be, I am not limited to doing any of my activities at home. A five would be, I am completely limited to doing all activities at home. Which number would you give yourself? And then a six. Number six is, I sleep soundly versus a five would be, I do not sleep soundly because of my condition. Now, this can be a little tricky sometimes. Because when somebody when I ask somebody, do you sleep soundly? He says, oh, yeah, I sleep wonderful. I said, oh, that's great. He says, you have no problems? Yeah, I don't wake up. I'm good. I said, okay. What type of routine that gets you in that type of pattern? He says, a bottle of whiskey and four ton OPMs. I was like, you're not sleeping well. No, 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 yeah. I sleep very well. It's like, no, you don't. Yeah, that'll do the trick. <laughs> It'll definitely do the trick. Yeah, sure. So, so does morphine. You know? I, I mean, technically, he's not wrong. <laughs> no, he's not wrong. But that's just, you know, that's, uh, that's ridiculous and absurd, but we shouldn't be doing something like that. So um, sleeping, if you take a lot of drugs to go to sleep, you might not be sleeping well. Anyways, you rate yourself from zero being the best sleep to five being the worst type of sleep. Uh, next question is energy level. Five would be I have no energy at all. Zero would be I have lots of energy. All right, it's just subjectively of how you feel. So what you would do is you would tally up you, you would count all the numbers up. So let's say you're at 5, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, you know, and you, you're marking at every one of these questions you had to put a 5 in. Well, that's very bad. I mean, that's a very bad sign to see. Uh, not that the person is very bad, like they did a bad job. It's just what they're going through is very, very severe, of course. Very, very, very severe. And, um, yeah, that's... And where did you say that uh, our viewers could find this? Uh, viewers can find it actually off the uh, American Association of Respiratory Care. You can find it off AARC. And this place has great information if you ever want to look at it. It's all free. AARC.org. ALA. And there was another one. Uh, I don't know where to find it on the Saint, uh, um, the one over in California. I don't remember where exactly it's at. It's on their, it's, uh, you know, it had to go on the, their pulmonary side uh, in that hospital. But anyways, if you go into the ARC or go on to Google, simple Google, and just type in COPD. or CAT, COPD assessment test, and just write that into your search. Uh, it'll come up uh, a lot of things, but look at images. Like there's those tabs where it's all, you know, uh, images, audio, whatever. Just click on images. So it'll pull up anything that has that title, and it'll pull up an image, and you'll see those forms right there. You'll also see something called an MMRC scale. We do those as well. The MMRC is it's a little different, but it's uh, you justify how you've been feeling for the last you know month or so, uh, and you rate yourself. 
from five being the worst? It's one question, but it's just a lot of questions in that one question that has a bunch of parts in it. <laughs> should should our viewers then print out those results and bring them to their doctor? Absolutely, they should uh, print them out for their doctor and write them out as best to their you know knowledge. Thank you. So we can't really you know self diagnose in that sense. You you can't self diagnose with it. It no, you can't. You have to take it to your doctor. Yeah, and there, there was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, patients I was seeing that they tend to try to diagnose themselves. Don't ever diagnose yourself because you're. You're adding more stuff. Yeah, like if I go on, uh, I'm not putting down a website like WebMD. Everybody puts down WebMD. You're fine. <laughs> but if you go on WebMD and you type in, okay, I have increased work of breathing. I have some congestion. I have, uh, uh, you know, I have something else. And it pulls up cancer. It pulls up this and that. That would just make me never want to talk to a doctor ever again. Well, yeah, I'm I mean, afraid that that's the old adage. Never WebMD yourself. <laughs> yeah, uh, you don't ever self-diagnose yourself. And a lot of people try to do that. It's like, oh, I have this. I have this. Then you have that other type of person that uh, that lays labels themselves as, you know, can't do this, can't do that. And they they just they just, you know, like in a way of saying they kind of just give up in life. But they. They, they label themselves at as, uh, you know, they're always trying to figure out what's wrong with them. And well, I see this often, very often. So, well, I'm trying to figure out because all these clinicians, they don't know what's wrong with me. It's not that we don't know. Like, it's not like those doctors don't know what's wrong with you. But if you keep searching and searching and searching, eventually you're going to find something, right? If you keep searching and searching the Internet and uh, not asking those questions to a doctor that knows you and can look at your records and do an assessment like a physical assessment you're shooting yourself in the foot every single time you know you, you are you're you know if you keep labeling yourself as i can't do this can't do that then you can't because you keep believing you can we also got to think that google webmd they're, they're going off of your searches if you're not being specific yeah you can't have a dialogue with google you know yeah so it's just something, oh, something yeah. to also think about. Like I know my, my mom was like that. She uh, she was uh, always trying to find out what's wrong with her, what's wrong with her, what's wrong with her. And I said, when are you going to start working on yourself? And she was like, I'm still searching what's wrong with me. And I said, it's been 10 years. And I said, all the doctors said what's wrong. And he says, yeah, but I think there's something else too. But you are neglecting yourself because you are not doing anything because you're trying to go into this search like what's wrong with you. Maybe... Why don't if I mean you can continue the search, sure, you know, but start working on yourself so you can at least improve those problems and maybe as you improve yourself in rehabilitation, uh, the underlying condition, those questionable things that you might have, might get resolved just by the exercises itself. So my mother, that's I said, stop searching. I I put her into my therapy program uh, with with me and. Her doctors just uh, were blown away. She, she was on kidney dialysis, and now she's down from kidney dialysis, uh, not, as, not as much time, meaning her kidneys are improving. Heart, uh, unbelievable. She had a, a stent put in. She had a, a, a heart surgery, everything. Her doctor said she's going to be on oxygen. She's gonna be, uh, she couldn't walk very far when she got out of surgery, and even before surgery, she couldn't walk very far. Now she's, I tell her, I says, I want less than two miles, and now she's doing two miles of walking on the treadmills in here, you know. And I said, that's the reason why I wanted you in my class. And I says, I want to get you, I want to get you better, Bob. <laughs> that's exactly what I did. So, just to. I can't hear you, but I have you on caption. Do you take Medicare and TRICARE insurance? So I, I believe they're listening, they're, they don't, they're not listening, they're just reading the captions when, with, through the stream. Uh, um, but yeah, do you so think you yes, we take all insurances, and I mean all insurances. Now Medicaid is a little tricky, but in Maryland we do accept Medicaid. Um, but Medicaid is is a little different. So like I said, be, uh, I'm not a biller. Uh, I'm a I'm a pulmonary care practitioner. But you know, if you ask the doctor what insurances you take, some doctors know, so some doctors don't. This is a little different because we have to work for the whole United States. This yeah. is not just in Maryland. You can go ahead and feel free to call our staff at 410-871-4601. Yes. 
just to put the number back out there again. So uh, let's transition into our uh, email questions. Please. Um, so uh, Laura from Colorado, uh, she is asking, uh, how do I deal with the stress and despair of IPF? Well, I know we have a video on this. Why would you so. deal with it? Like, how is that going to help you? He's talking about IPF. Well, how would you deal with it? Why would you want to deal with it? Why not just get rehabilitated so you don't have to deal with it? That's We just mentioned that with... Uh, one of our patients that had IPF, um, that was a firefighter. Uh, was that the IP? That was, uh, yes. that was pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, so worked a little differently, but we have IPF patients, but they don't deal with it. They stretch out their lungs like I show them. I, they do the exercise with me. Um, they start getting tested off of oxygen if they're on oxygen. Uh, they do a lot of rehabilitation with us Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for an hour and a half. Uh, but they don't deal with it. They fix it. That's what we do. Why would you, anybody here would want to, seriously, is that what everyone wants to deal with? Why would you deal with COPD? Why would you deal with that? There's always a resolution to something. You just have to go to a specialist that really knows the ins and outs of that disease. But from this date, I have never had somebody who had to deal with their symptoms afterwards. They usually get, let me, where's my phone? Let me, let me just, let me just kind of, I know I'm doing a lot of running, right? One second, I'm just going to grab my phone really quick. There. And just so you know, <coughs> just so you know, I'm not, this is a text message. Okay. Just so you can see, I am not making this up. This is a text message over to me. Let's go over to the... Closer. Oh, it's okay. It's no problem. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to read it out. Okay. okay. Good morning, Dr. Alex. Let's call her Dr. Alex. Uh, good morning, Dr. Alex. I wanted to uh, share my experiences with you as I am so happy and proud. Yesterday, I needed to run an errand that required me to go uh, to the nearby mall. I decided to go without my auction for the first time in approximately three to four years. I walked in the mall at a slow but steady pace, did my deep breathing. Um, she said, no nuts for me, uh, LOL, meaning um, I always mention, don't breathe like a squirrel because that's nuts, you know, because squirrels eat nuts. Anyways, uh, with shoulders back and standing tall, went up to the escalator, back down, and walked back to my car. I did very well, hardly short of breath. People were saying hello and talking to me rather than asking if I was okay. I felt so happy and accomplished proud and young again until blood uh, until god blessed me with you and i will and a will to want to do better i haven't been able to uh, even walk to the mailbox with sitting to catch my breath i just got this this morning by the way people would stop to ask me if i was okay did i need help i now will walk to my mail i will do what everything i can do Part of my issue is muscle atrophy because of uh, COVID. I didn't leave my house per my physician. I became a little depressed and a lot crazy. No more, she puts exclamation marks on that. I can't thank you enough for helping me, being a patient with me, and being patient with me, pushing me, believing in me, uh, just being the, uh, the great, fabulous person and great doctor therapist you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Alex. I mean, I think, oh, it's I think that just that just helps uh, to emphasize the reason why we fight so hard here. Yeah. It's like that. That is just I love that. Really love that. You know, where somebody didn't think cause I always tell everybody, I said, you're going to get rehabilitated. I'm not going to stop until you do. You know, you give me those goals. I'm going to let you know if they're realistic or not. You know, but if your goal is to, uh, to at least walk a mile to breathe better, increase your lung functions by at least more than 40%, like 30%, 40%. Yes, that's exactly what will happen. If your goal is to come off oxygen, wean down off oxygen, yes, that's what we do. We'll, we'll do that. You know, it, those are realistic goals. Even if, you know, some people haven't walked for 5, 10 feet, you know, people are on oxygen, people are bed bound. We get those types of people. That's the people we want. We don't want the people that can walk 10 miles when they come in. We want the person that can only walk a couple feet before they have to sit down and rest. That's what we want. 
because we love that. We love seeing somebody that can't do a lot, getting them back to where they want to be at, where they should be at, enjoying their life, going outside, enjoying the weather with, good, with, with hopefully good weather, but going outside and getting their life back. I mean, that's just, I love that. I, think, I love that. I think that that just is an example of why it's important not to deal with yes. what you're suffering with. You don't it's, deal. Exactly. Don't, don't, exactly. Don't deal, fix it. Yeah. Know? Don't. Did right. that person deal with it? No. They got help. They got help. They took control. You know? I mean, imagine this. Imagine this. You are the person who always sits down, doesn't do a lot. And then one day, one day, somebody tells you, try it like this instead. Personal breathe for 10 seconds, take one step, breathe in, one step, breathe out, and coaches you on every single thing that you're going to be doing or what you, to accomplish a certain task. So one day that you couldn't do a lot, you just said, you know what, I'm going to listen to exactly what he said or what she said to, for me to do in my home. And the person takes it upon themselves to stand up and pull in a little bit of guts in them and not necessarily coming out of their comfort zones, but tippy-toeing in the uncomfortable areas, meaning those are stairs, I can't do stairs, but they test flight, you know, two steps up, three steps in, four steps in, no problems there. Those are people that are not necessarily taking a huge risk. They're just utilizing the techniques provided, doing the exercises in class, and now that person that was sitting down is not sitting down as much anymore. Um, there's, there's always a million reasons not to do something, you know, always, always is. But uh, if yes. any of our viewers have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the comment section. Yeah. Um, we have about three minutes left, so if you have questions, please write in the comment section. I'll be happy to address so, those. Uh, we'll go to one last one from our email. Sure. Uh, and this is from Cheryl, and it kind of uh, goes off of what you were just talking about. Uh, yeah. Cheryl from Will County, Illinois. Illinois? Uh, Welcome. Uh, how can I become more active? I mean, you, you had mentioned it's taking that one step at a time sort yes. of thing. So maybe, uh, I mean, after listening to you for, I've been here almost, what, four or five months at this point. So yeah. it, it just taking the smaller step, you know, is definitely important before you can take the big leap. Yeah. Well, let's, pre let's talk about how to become more active, okay? Well, that's... Ooh, that's hard to see. Okay, right there is probably easier to see. Uh, it was just uh, blacking out. Anyways, so let's say this is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Oh, there's Saturday over here. Okay. Okay. Real simple. How to be more active. First off, before you write down anything besides a, a first week calendar, you know, just one week calendar. Put in that calendar, what have you been doing every day? Like how much exercise have you been doing? What type? You don't have to write in paragraphs, just something simple. Uh, let's see, Sunday I watched TV. I got up to go to the mail, okay? That was about 20 feet, okay? One direction, total 40 feet, you know? So I'll put that times two. Uh, Monday, I didn't do a lot. So you put in what you have been doing. The next week, you're going to plan out. This is your start week. And let's just pretend they run on the same amount of time, like the, the columns are the same. So this is still Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. The next week, you're going to plan what type of exercise would you start with. Well, let's say up here on that one week that you were that what you usually have done was you sat around 60% of the time. Okay? You did some light cleaning. Okay? Uh, maybe you did some light cleaning, maybe you did some uh, you bathed. Okay? Uh, on Wednesday you did something else and you know whatever. But all together, let's say the total accumulation of steps was 500 feet, okay, in total. So what should you do on this week that you're planning to change your physical, you know, your, your, your abilities, your exercise, your exercise toleration? What should you do? 
Should we start with, all right, you know what, starting this week, because I've only been doing 500 feet for the whole entire week, meaning every single day wasn't 500 feet, it's just accumulation was 500. That's fairly bad, by the way. You don't ever want that. You don't ever want that. This should be uh, past 10 miles. That, it should be. <laughs> it's past 10 miles. I mean, I walk around the office, and I have a pedometer on, and I, I walk two miles, like, per day minimum, you know, sometimes about five to ten miles per day walking in my office, going around and walking, you know. Not just walking because I want to walk, because I, I'm doing things. So, but 500 feet only for the whole week? Yeah, you're not going to get a lot out of it. So, so what should we put for the first day? So let's, let's say on Sunday, we start Sunday, and you did a, uh, a ten, let's say, a one-mile walk. No, that's not going to be unrealistic. You're not going to want to do that. I'm going to force myself. Don't. Your body is specifically telling you not to. Because as soon as you, fig you think that or you're hesitant about that, Miles, hmm, I'm questioning that. There's a red flag happening in your head right now, and your body knows, like, not yet. Not yet. You soon will be, but not yet. But I think, well, Miles is a little bit too ambitious. So if I'm doing 500 feet, why don't, why don't you start like this? I will... First thing in the morning, I'll do stretching. I will also, uh, while I'm eating breakfast, I am going to work out my calculations. I'm going to figure out what my maximum heart rate is. So when I start my workout routine, I know I'm, not go I'm going to stay safe. I'm not going overboard. I'm not going to do something that's not going to be, you know, strategic and, and smart. So I want to make sure I'm, I'm doing everything smart. So... First, I would label down on this, like on the week that you're planning, label down how far can you walk before you have to stop. So let's say if I asked you right now, how far can you walk before you have to stop? What number would you give me? What, how many feet would you give me? Let's say, I don't know, I can probably walk 20 feet before I have to stop. Okay? Okay. So then I'm going to add the 20 feet over here. 20 feet. Then on Monday, I'm going to walk how many feet? 21 feet. On Tuesday, how many feet should I be walking? 22. Every day, climb by one minute, if you can, okay? Or uh, just one extra foot, I mean. So this would be 20 feet, 21, 22. So then it looks like a 27. 23 feet. And every single day, you're passing what you did before, even if it's not a lot, but still. I mean, if you could do more than that, great, but don't overdo it. That's the worst thing people do is they try to overdo it because they've been out of shape. They haven't worked out for a long time. They, so they think, for six months I haven't worked out, so let me just put in a whole day of aggressive workout. It's the horrible thing to do. It's Exercise is a therapy. Okay, what do I mean by therapy? Therapeutic? Sure, but it's not one pill. Meaning you don't just do it once and you're good for the next six months. You got to do it every day. It's therapeutic. One minute of therapy is not going to be therapeutic. One day of therapy is not going to be therapeutic. You got to devote more time to this, you know, but don't overdo it. So I do stretches and let's say on Monday I do another stretch, you know. On Tuesday I do another stretch. On Wednesday I keep it relaxing a little bit. Let's say I move the 23 feet over here. On here, I'm going to do stress management. Okay. On my stress management, all I want to do is I just want to go outside and close my eyes and listen to the sounds around my surroundings and try to paint the image of what, I'm, what my ears are listening to. So if I close my eyes and it's daytime, I'm going to pretend there's a tree on my right, there's a bird on the top right of that tree, there's a road about 100 yards out in front with cars driving by, which I can see cars driving by. The longer you keep your eyes closed and the more you're painting the image in your head, the less your mind is focusing on stress. That's part of stress management. Or you can just sit down on a park bench and just listen. Just relax and just concentrate on breathing. So just put yourself in the headspace is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, exactly. And the next day, let's say you go to 24 feet. But let's say on Saturday, I'm going to leave Saturday for strengthening because my legs are weak. So my arms are weak, let's say. My legs are weak. Well, if they're weak, then you need to really add in some strength training. So what types of routines would I do for strength training? 
always start light. Always. Always make sure you do stretches before and after. But start with three and fives. What I mean by three and fives. What does it mean by three and fives? Three sets of five repetitions. I know it won't seem like a lot. You always start slow. Take it from professionals like me. Start out slow. Never overdo it. Because imagine you can walk. So let's say you can walk or one person can walk for 10 minutes. Okay? So you have a person that can walk for 10 minutes. And the person's walking for 10 minutes. The next day they walk for 10 minutes. The next day they walk for 10 minutes. How far can they walk? Of course, 10 minutes. But anyways, so we always want to increase that, you know, without a doubt. We always want to increase our tolerations. But uh, if I'm going to focus on my legs, and let's say I'm walking, but I notice that my legs are a little weak, three sets of five repetitions. If you overdo it, um, let's say instead of doing three and fives, you want to do 20 and 20s which are advanced, but let's say you want to overdo it. Next time you look at that exercise or you look at that calendar you made up as that plan, it will never look appealing. So imagine you take somebody who can walk 10 minutes and, and that person told you, and you're the clinician, person told you I can walk for 10 minutes. Okay, I'm going to work, walk you for five minutes, but I can do 10 minutes. I know, but I'm still going to walk you for five minutes. Why? Because five minutes is nothing to you. So, well, 10 minutes is where stress, anxiety goes up because now you're starting to feel it and you want to sit down and rest. If I walk you for five minutes first, the next day I walk you for another five minutes, maybe six minutes, why, why would I do it that way? Anybody know? Why would I do it that way? So, mental, mentality. You're exercising. And you go into a gym, okay? You keep yourself hungry for more, wanting more. I go into a gym and I pick up some weights, even though I could do a lot more repetitions, I could do a lot more on time, I don't. I leave it where my heart rate isn't going very high. I keep it at 40 to 80% of my maximum heart rate. That's at 220 minus your age. Uh, on exercise tolerations, I never overdo it. I make sure I'm obtaining the right meal plan for me. I'll talk to a dietitian, you know, or I'll just, you know, talk to my doctor. Maybe my doctor will have some good insights of what I should be around. Uh, what should I eat, you know, because now I'm changing my lazy habit to a more better habit. The thing is, when it comes to stress, if your habit, whatever you do, uh, everyone has a type of habit, you know, when stress goes up, like when your stress levels are very high up in the air, you go back to your habits. So whatever habit you want to make, exercise habits, make them beneficial to you. So when you go back to your habits that you, like my son's habit is to play with his fingers. You know, that's his one habit. So when he's stressed out, he'll forget everything and just go straight to habit which is picking on his fingers. And then I was like, as soon as I see him picking on his fingers, like, Jeremy, are you stressed out? And he's like, yeah. And I said, okay, let's talk about it. Okay, because if I don't help him with that, then he's going to do what? Keep picking on his fingers until his fingers bleed, you know? So habit, if you make this into a habit, every time you're stressed out, you go back to exercising because that habit was wonderful. You know, you weren't overdoing it. You weren't going too crazy on your exercises, you're keeping it within normal limits. This was fun and enjoyable versus I made it hectic for me. I gave myself an own personalized boot camp. I nearly passed out when I was exercising. Every time I think of that exercise, that calendar, I'm going to freak out. I'm going to be like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm not ready for that. That's, that's, that was horrible. That I, I, it took me, you know, three weeks to recover from that exercise, that exercise plan. Start with an exercise that's low and easy, easy to do, you know, and then slowly perpetuate yourself. How do we eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You can't just, you know, one bite at a time. You always make it to the end, you know. So you have to always tackle things one step at a time, you know. Uh, I think that's a great, uh, great closure at the end there. Yeah. Right, taking yeah. One, one bite at a time. Thank uh, you. So uh, this is just one final Thank question you, from Glenda. Yeah. Um, 
she is taking clonazepam. She would like to know um, if taking uh, taking that medication would affect her breathing. I would assume the answer would be to talk to her. Uh, Doctor would be the best one, yeah. uh, just because um, certain medications uh, it sometimes can be a hit and miss for certain people. Like, let's say you have one medication for one person, and the person with the same diagnosis will probably have a separate medication, a different one, because that person was allergic to this and that, and this person's body is a little different versus this person's body a little, you know. It, it's just it's best to talk to your doctor about this, because if I, I, if I told you that, it, hey, it can cause a little bit of wheezing, could cause an exacerbation, and nothing like that happens, you'll never trust me again. But from people that take that certain medication, that happens to, but you are a little different from everyone else, just like everybody in the world is. So I would say the best, uh, best suggestion is talk to your doctor about the side effects, potential harms, and uh, any complications, contraindications, things like that. That's a great way, a great place to put that. Uh, so we want to thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you very uh, much, Alex, guys. As always, thank you for hosting. Uh, I have been John with the Home Rehab Network. Uh, if you would like to find out more information, please call our staff at 410-871-4601. Again, that's 410-871-4601. Our Thank staff everybody. is waiting for your call. Thank you so much. To talk to you. See you guys. Bye.